great is his steadfast love for those who fear him. come before you just humbled at the love of God for us in Christ Jesus that you gave us. And Lord, I'm just so grateful that you are an unchanging God. Your love will never change for us, Lord. It is faithful and it is promised and it endures into all eternity. So we just praise you this morning and thank you that the love of God is so vast and so great. We can't comprehend it. We can't write about it. We can't give it words enough to express the depth and the magnitude of it. So thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can trust in it and hold fast to it and cling to it with all that we have. Lord, thank you so much that the aim of our charge is love, and we just pray this morning that that would be the aim of our charge as well, that our life's goal would be to love with the love of Christ. 
Thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you for the good news of the gospel, for your death and resurrection and your life in us that goes on to eternity. We just want to give you thanks and praise. And I pray now for Pastor John and the rest of our service that as he speaks, Lord, we would hear your voice and it would move us forward in faith and in steps with you and help us to love more like you do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and children, you are dismissed now for Children's Church. If you want to turn in your Bibles, we're back in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In your pew Bible, that's 1,177, if you want to turn there. And I'm going to read verses 3 to 11. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into, away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Let's pray. Father, we praise you this morning for your word. What a gift to give it to us and show us your glory and show us your son. We pray now that our hearts would be opened to receive your word. Oh, how we need Jesus. Father, forgive us when our hearts have grown cold. Forgive us when our love has grown cold, both to you and to our brothers, our sisters, our spouses, our children. Forgive us, Father, when our love has grown cold towards the world that needs you that needs your son. And so, uh, Father, the aim of this charge is love. I pray that you would just raise the temperature in our hearts of love. Show us Christ. Show us your great love for us. I pray now for Pastor John. Father, I pray that you'd anoint him with your Holy Spirit. Oh, how we need your Holy Spirit now for him to preach, for us to receive and to do what this word instructs us to do and to know you oh father how we need your holy spirit even to know you and to love you so he is here i praise you fill us in jesus name amen let's pretend you just moved to a new city Let's just say it's Ephesus. And so among the first things you want to do is find a church. And fortunately, there's only one, the church at Ephesus. So you went to a meeting that they were going to have looking ahead to some long-range planning and some sermon or uh, ministry planning. And, and so you walked in and there was a big table of leaders and pastors and whatever. And and uh, someone said, well, what should the, what do you think our goal or our outcome should be? What should we be 
kind of looking for in this next ministry season, and and it was kind of quiet for a little while. And then someone said, "Well, what if we, what if we shot for some vain discussion in our small group ministry and our classes?" And somebody said, "Well, that you know that sounds. What if we had some endless genealogies and we could just go on and on about that and kind of go in circles?" And then finally, a third person spoke up and said, "Well." Let's not forget quarrels. Let's let's have a you know a healthy mix of these things, and so we can grin at that and smile at that because you if you were that person sitting in that room, you'd have made a beeline out for your car to get away from there, find a different church. But this is exactly what was happening in Ephesus. They had a lot of teaching going on. They in some respects, have doctrinal purity. We see that from Revelation uh, and the letters to the churches. And yet, when we drop into 1 Timothy, which is a pastoral, it's a church um, epistle like 2 Timothy and Titus as well, the three of these are really written to to pastors, up-and-coming younger pastors, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, telling them how to lead the church and how we ought to uh, conduct ourselves in the church. We get this from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And yet Paul hears the reports that in the church there's a combination probably of teaching and teachers and conversations and the outcome of those conversations is quarreling and vain discussions and endless wrangling. And Paul speaks to Timothy and says, Timothy, I want you to go and bring a halt to this. Have these people stop teaching and talking like that. This is such a common thread through the pastoral epistles that if we take a quick glance down, I won't turn to all of these, but I have them printed out. When we look at what's going on and then look at the fruit of it, what the, I kind of like the word outcome better than fruit, but earlier in the week I I chose fruit, but same same thing. What's, What's the outcome? When we do what we do, what do we, what do we see? And so Paul gives very, very clear directions on this. And here's a couple of other uh, verses from chapter 6 talking about some of these people that talk like this. They have an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels about words which produces, there's the outcome, which produces envy, dissension, slander, and evil suspicions. 2 Timothy 2 says, that there are foolish and stupid arguments that breed, there's the outcome, that breed quarrels. And in Titus, it says, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and dissensions and quarrels about the law. What's the outcome? For they are unprofitable and worthless. All the talking, and you get done, and you've gotten nowhere. And so Paul gives us, drops into this section that Rusty just read, this verse 5. I touched a little bit on it last week, and it's just so good I wanted to come back to it today because Paul gives us sort of a practical guide. So when I look at my life, like, what's the outcome? The last few years, it seems like I use the phrase at the end of the day. Uh, a lot. I don't know where I why I started doing that, but uh, and and I think when we say, well, at the end of the day, what do we want to accomplish at in Awana, or at the end of the day, what are Sunday mornings our theme and and things like that. And so when we when we look at the end of the day, what do I want to see in my Christian life? What do I want to view? What's the outcome I'm looking for? Paul helps us here, and by the time we get through this very easy, very simple passage, actually, 
uh, it'll give us some really, really good understanding, a little what I've called a checklist that I use in my quiet time since we've been going through First Timothy again. I've used this verse over and over again. When I just want to, at the end of the day, I want to just stop and say and look back and say, how am I doing with the Lord? How are, how are things going? How's my walk? How's my faith? And these things in verse, this short little verse are really good. Let's just go through uh, some key words here. The first word I want to look at is the word aim and the, this as an observation. And, and the aim is uh, a, a Greek word that often is translated most of the time in the ESV is translated the, the end. And, and so that's the end of the, the ministry or the, at the end of the day, that, that end. What does it look like in the end? And, and so it's, it's a, very similar to the word fruit, which is common. Jesus said, you remember, if you have an unhealthy tree, it's not going to produce really healthy fruit. <laughs> and a healthy tree isn't going to produce bad fruit that this idea of fruit, and those are outcomes. And so when I look at this word aim, uh, it, it means that, that outcome. It's not talking about the means of the Christian life. That would be walking with my, w- w- abiding in the word, eyes on Christ, yielded to the spirit, walking in the spirit. That would be the means. But how do I test what do I look for to see how I'm doing in that walk? And that's what this is. What's the end of this? What's the outcome of this that, uh, that we can look at at the end of that day? I want to just uh, read. This is so well uh, used in Romans 6, 21 and, 20, 20, 21 and 22. And I'll just read it to you. But what fruit, there's the outcome. What outcome, what fruit are, were you getting at that time from things which you are now ashamed? He's talking to believers looking back to their former life. What fruit were you getting at that time from the things which you're now ashamed? For the end, there's fruit, the outcome, the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God. The fruit, there's the outcome, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end or outcome, the outcome of sanctification, is eternal life. See how he uses that? So we're, we're looking at our life like, what is this, what is this aim so that I can, I can analyze a, a little bit and see, are we on the right track? Am I on the right track in my, in my life? So it's a, it's a really practical uh, word. And then the word love is the next word that we can make an, a couple of observations about. So Paul is saying the aim, the outcome, what I'm looking for if I'm as I walk with Christ, eyes on Christ, according to that glorious gospel, what I'm going to look for in my life is love. That's the outcome. And so a couple of comments about love. One is that this is agape love, and so this love is it's God's love. This is such a, a it's such a, it seems like such a small issue, and yet this is profound. It's God's love. The only way you will have God's love working out and seen in your life is if God does it. It's not human. It's not your disposition. It's not your personality. It's not saying, oh, yeah, this is really a good verse. I guess I should be, you know, I should be a more loving person. This is biblical love that comes from one source, and that is God. The source of this love is nothing short of the very character of God. I love, I have over, in the, if you have your handout, I have over in the sidebar there, 1 John 7, excuse me, 1 John 4, 7 to 11. And let me just read uh, a couple of these verses. Uh, there's three things that this tells us. This is a perfect parallel for this. Beloved, let us love one another. So we'll come back to that in a minute. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, 
Because God is what? God is love. So whatever that means, the, the intrinsic character of God, and, and I, you know, the, the character of God is, uh, there's a theological idea called the simplicity of God, meaning that God is everything he is all the time in perfect balance. So us, you know, you can be angry one minute, cool down, and you can be kind and like this. And with, with God, all of his attributes and character are always in perfect balance, perfect balance. And yet here it tells us, and we see other verses, that part of that center character and attribute of God is love. And therefore, people who say that I have accepted you know, Christ and I know God, I've come to know God through salvation, through Christ, this verse is actually saying that the proof of that is love in your life. Isn't that interesting? Can't it just be a personal thing, <laughs> John? Does it have to does it have to show can't I just say that I know God and I don't like people very much? <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's not even hard to interpret this verse. It means that if we know God and we have God living in us through the gospel, through accepting Christ and Christ sending the helper inside of us, the Spirit of God, if that is so, then love will be manifested in my life. Now, there's obstacles, and we'll get to those in a couple of minutes. But this is so critical to understand. And then he goes on to say about this love. So first, it's not some romantic, emotional vision of love that we have, like to try to be a, you know, change my personality or my temperament. But this is, this is the rock-solid character of God and his love. And then it goes on to say in verse 9 and 10, and this love of God was made manifest among us, so we're at the edge of our seat now, because I want to see the love of God. It seems like it's not a material thing. How do we see the love of God? Well, it was manifested, made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him in this, in, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, my favorite word, propitiation for our sins. Here's what he's saying. This love of God came, and it, its chief manifestation was the Lord Jesus Christ in his incarnation and his life but especially on the cross when he, the one who knew no sin became sin, took your sins and mine upon himself and died and through his bloodshed paid the price for our sin. And so whenever we wonder, ah, does God really love me? All we have to do is look at the cross. This is the answer right here. It's the cross. And when you think back, and I don't know what your life was like, but I look back in my life and some of the dark chapters and things that, like Paul says in Romans 6, I'm now ashamed of, those kinds of things, I know that those things were brought to the cross and nailed to the cross. And they are as far as the east is from the west in the mind of God because of the death of Christ. Why? Because he paid the price because he paid the price. And I want to suggest to us here just a practical thing, that when we go through life and I say, I want to, I want to love people better, my, my family and my, my neighborhood and my church and, and the marketplace and, and that, I want, to, I want to love people better, one of the great hindrances of, of a heart and a life that can love one another well, love other people well, is when we have this stubborn uh, legal sense that when something goes wrong or I'm wounded or hurt or whatever it is, that somebody needs to pay for that. This is a stubborn thing that, that is kind of deep, deep, legally imprinted 
in our, in our hearts. How many times do we say, maybe we don't actually say it with, with words, but we feel like someone needs to pay. Or maybe you're the one that's failed, and you feel like somehow I need to pay for this. And what 1 John 4 understood in this light of 1 Timothy 1.5 is that you're absolutely right, somebody needs to pay, but somebody has already paid. And so when I run into things, you know, we if you haven't noticed, we live in an imperfect world. And so everything, you know, from the politics to the neighborhoods to, you know, sports, I mean, there's not an area of life that's not touched by by imperfect people because we're, because we're sinners. And so we have endless opportunities to be offended and endless opportunities to feel like they need to pay the price for this. Someone needs to pay for this. And what the love of God does, it shows us and tells us, like the songs that we sang, that God knew that somebody did need to pay and Jesus paid the price. And so when I can release those hurts and things that come my way, when I can release those things, I left this over here. Remember the red papers of December? But when I'm hurt and I'm wounded and I'm angry as all get out at somebody for for hurting me, and, and I feel like there's something quietly inside of me that says somebody needs to pay. I was hurt. But when I can take that hurt and articulate that hurt and bring it to the cross, I can understand that it's the death of Christ that paid for that. And if Christ paid for that, then I don't need to pay for it, and I don't need to force that person to pay for it. And so as I understand that, as I understand the forgiveness and the payment on the cross, love increases. As I don't understand this, that Christ paid that price on the cross, it becomes a stumbling block and an obstacle for me loving other people. Does that make sense? And so when Paul says the aim of our instruction, our charge, is love, and it's God's love, and it's a strong, it's not just some emotional, although it's emotional a lot of the time, but it is an actual legal transaction where God sent Christ to die for our sins. And when I come to Christ, every sin in my life, in my history, has been nailed to the cross. And when I grasp that and understand that and appreciate that, it allows me, it frees me then to love imperfect people and people that have hurt me or people that have wounded me or, or people that have disappointed me and all of those kinds of things that life is all about. The cross, the love of God, is the answer for that. And when I can, and that's what Paul says in verse 11 when he talks about in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, which I've been entrusted, he's talking about the gospel. That's what he's talking about. Not just gospel, some little some nice Christian word or something. It's, it's the guts and reality of the death of Christ. And God looking down like 1 John says, and there was a propitiation when Jesus said, it is finished and died. And propitiation, as you know, means that in the halls of heaven, a holy and righteous God who had been offended in every imaginable way by us said it's paid in full. Done. That's the love that we're looking for as an outcome. And it's interesting to me that when I look in, this would be the third observation on your handouts there if you're following along there. When I, when I look at this, uh, that this love of God towards me, that the gospel This love is expressed, the outcome that he's talking about here. Excuse me. When I look at the descriptions of love, it's expressed towards others. So it would, of course, be true to say that I love my love for God, my love for Christ grows. Of course, that would be true. Of course, that'd be true. 
But it's also true that Paul ends, excuse me, John ends 1 John 4, 7 to 11 that we've been going through here. Verse 11, he ends this by saying, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And so this love that we're our aim here is to grasp this love of God, to understand, which is essentially the gospel, and, and to grasp that in my own life And as that happens, it begins to manifest itself in my relationships with you or my family or my neighbors or wherever I might be. And so what comes out isn't just, you know, I just, you know, like people a lot more than I ever did before, something like that. It means that I understand that encompassing love of God. Here's one of the best definitions, one of the few definitions other than the gospel descriptions like we just went through in first John. First Corinthians thirteen, four to eleven, four to four to seven. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. Do you see how these are all relational? You could take these right off you're married, you could take it right home and look at these in your marriage, test your marriage. You could, If you're a kid, you could see if you're doing this with your parents and parents to kids and within the body of Christ. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable and resentful or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And so these are relational. And and then if you go to Galatians 5, this would be another uh, similar, not exactly all a description of of love, although some commentators feel that the fruit of the Spirit starts with love, the big one right in the beginning, and that everything else maybe tails out of that, and, and perhaps that's true. But the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, when I walk in the Spirit, when I'm really walking in the Spirit, in connection with the Spirit, hearing and responsive, and and following his direction, the fruit of that is love (laughs) and and the others, joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And so these are things that, that are relational. So I can't read this and just say, well, I'm kind of a private person. I do have a lot of love in my heart. I think the scriptural testimony here is that if that love, if you're walking with Christ and that love is manifested, that love will be manifested and it will affect the people in your circle of influence and your circle that you live in. Does that make sense? It's not private. I, I've told the story many times. One of the most uh, illustrative relationships in my life was uh, Pastor Young, Bruce Young, died here a couple of Januaries ago. And I and I won't tell old stories that you've heard me say about him, but I learned so much from Bruce, uh, a godly, godly, godly man that was on fire for the Lord till really the day he died when his body was shot and his mind wasn't working great. He was still in love with the the Lord. And and uh, in his life, when I looked over it, and it's funny, you appreciate things more after the fact. Isn't that unfortunate? And uh, But as I look back in his life and saw Bruce at different times come under great attack and great opposition and unfair opposition and, and things, uh, I, I never saw, I could just honestly say, I never saw him bitter one time in my life. I honestly never, did, never, not one time. And when I felt like, and I've told you this story before, but as a young pastor under him, there was a, a time when he went through something and I didn't support him and I should have, and I knew I should have, but I didn't. And it bothered me so much when he moved off and went into another ministry and came back through town. We we had lunch together and I knew that I needed to sit down, look across the table and ask him to forgive me. And I knew that he didn't, he, he knew what I was talking about. And as I was spitting this out, hardest thing, one of the hardest things for me to do. So 
humbling and and uh, and to say that you know Bruce I didn't support you when I should have and and that Bruce got this big grin on his face and I thought aren't you hearing me don't you hear what I'm saying here I didn't back you up when I should have well he knew that and long ago when this young upstart pastor had not backed him up this is what he did You see, it was years behind him. And it wasn't mind over matter. It wasn't, oh, let's just time time heals. This is what heals. And he said, you know, I'm going to just put that on the cross. And I'm done with it because Jesus has that. That's why he could smile. And he also understood that I was going through, I was learning a lesson that would serve me the rest of my life. That's the love of God. That's an outcome. (laughs) Sitting in that restaurant back in whatever that would have been, 1979 or something like that, 1980, that was the outcome, the love of God. And so we have from the first John, love from God. God pays that price second and third in this point that that love is expressed to people so that patience and kindness and all of those things are all flowing out of Holy Spirited, Spirit-generated love in the yielded believer's life. Say that three times real quick. <laughs> That's the love of God flowing visibly through the life of a believer who is yielded to following Christ, filled with the Spirit. That's what he's saying. If you want to see how you're doing, church at Ephesus, and you need to, vain discussions, endless wrangling, quarrels, Uh, Those aren't the outcomes we're looking for, are they? (laughs) They come naturally. Paul is saying, let your outcomes be that spirit-dependent love of God flowing through your life into the circles that you live in. And what I love about this passage is the next line and I've just named this, this love, this what we're talking about, is only spiritually maintained. And I'm not sure that's the, the best terminology, but it's a spiritual maintenance. It's a spiritual source for this. So nothing just mechanical that I can do is going gonna, is gonna to produce this. There is a, there is a spiritual, and I like to think of these three things like like as checkpoints. When I come to these points in my life, like the end of a week, sometimes at the end of a day, the end of a month, or the end of a season, or the end of the year, you know, New Year's or something, any time that you're just saying, I'm going to take a minute and look back. I want to just look back and see how I'm really doing with Christ. How was this year for me? Paul is saying, this is what to look for. This is the This is a standard here for have you grown in this in this love? And and the way I keep this growing is by these three checkpoints. And and I suppose we could go a long time on this, and I'm going to go over these briefly because they're not really that hard to understand. Three things w- will help you because remember he says love that issues from. So the love is is flowing. It's like the pure heart, clear, good conscience. Sincere faith, love is flowing out of that. Let's look at the three of these. First of all, a pure, a pure heart. There's so many things we could read about this many, many times as is talked about in the scripture. But I, I just think to make it simple for us, I, I think this is our motivation. What's, what's my motivation in life? And you say, well, isn't my mo- our motivation always all of us to just please God? Well, apparently not because Jesus goes to great ends to teach us that a human condition 
is to practice your righteousness before people in order that you'll be seen by them. (laughs) And he says this about practicing your righteousness. He says it about prayer. He says it about fasting. And he says it about giving. And this is the Son of God saying this. (laughs) So not some psychologist, you know, off someplace. And so a pure heart means that my heart is just, just my desire to walk with and follow Christ. And one of the things that crowds in on it, if you haven't noticed, is, is this thing, like this is just one example, there'd be other examples as well, but of wanting to be seen, of wanting to, my righteousness to be seen. I want to be, I'd like to be at the head of the class. I'd like to press so that people can really recognize what they have in me, you know. And when you're doing that, then people know what they really have in you. (laughs) And so a pure heart to me just seems like I'm facing things, I'm making decisions. It's really simple, it's clear. What is Jesus calling me to do? What does the Word say? That's where I want to go. People see it, people don't see it. If nobody ever sees it, praise the Lord. Because the issue in my heart is just to follow Christ. And so then we look at the second one, a good, a good conscience. And it's uh, good as, uh, it's the idea of a clear conscience. Uh, and I think this is a, a little checkpoint question for me. Am I following Christ? I'm, I'm a list person. I've got a, and I also love notebooks. I've, I've paid more for notebooks than I care to admit to anybody. I love, you know, spiral bounds, really quality, nice ones and things like this. And I, but I do lists. And I've gotten into the habit this last year or so to k- not tear the old list out so I can stop once in a while when I've got a minute and go back and page back. And do you know, every once in a while it's like, call so-and-so or pray for so-and-so. Something that I, I remember back, you know, the Lord put it on my heart. And when I get done with something, I cross it off. And then I look back and I see, you know, God spoke to me about that and I didn't do it. And so not beating myself, I flee back to the cross. I thank the Lord for forgiveness, for, for that I didn't follow him in that. And then that gives me an opportunity to clear my conscience and go and do it. Clear, clear that up. Somebody used to say, keep your list short with the Lord and with people. Acts 24, 16 says, so I, Paul, uh, Paul says, so I always take pains. So he works. I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. And so when I have stuff that's not done, where I haven't followed the Lord, it becomes just cumbersome in my walk with the Lord. And so my goal, my outcome, is to walk with him so that love will be expressed through my life. I'll be walking in this love. And yet if I've got a list over here and a list over here and some things that the Lord spoke to me about and I haven't done these things, there's no question it becomes an obstacle for following the Lord. And so I see Paul's little list here that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience. Just like a checklist to be able to say with a pure heart, are there things that are crowding out my pure and simple devotion to Jesus? That's a pure heart. Are there things that the Lord has spoken to me, between me and other people as well, that I have not done or things I've done that I shouldn't have done? And all this is saying is just take care of them. Just take care of them. We don't beat ourselves up because that was already done to Christ, but we keep that list clear. And a sincere faith. And my, my verse here is Romans 4, 18 to 21. One of my favorite verses on, on faith. Listen to this about Abraham. In hope he believed against hope, hope against hope, that he should be the father, become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so your offspring shall be. 
So God had told him that he was going to be the father of, of, of uh, many nations. So God so, told him that. The offspring, he had the promise of God. And then verse 19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So what Paul is, what uh, we're being taught here is that the promises of God, there will always be really good circumstantial reasons not to believe them. <laughs> They're unrealistic. They must be figurative or, or something like that. And it's saying here, teaching us that when Abraham heard this, um, that that he he knew that he was going to be the father of many nations, he didn't become weak in his faith, looking at circumstances. Verse twenty: No unbelief, no unbelief made him waver, considering the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully. This is the great ending here: fully convinced that God was able to do that which he promised. Isn't that good? How many times do we have a direction from God or a promise from God, a clear scripture, and yet you step back away from your Bible and there's there's circumstances here, circumstance, 10 reasons here, 15 reasons here, all these reasons not to take it at face value. (laughs) And that's a sincere faith. A sincere faith says, yep, 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 everything's stacked against me. But if God said it, he's going to do it. I trust him. And I'm going to walk in it with a pure heart because that's all I want to do is follow him. And my conscience is clear and my faith is sincere. Uh, Sometimes they translate this word genuine, but it means it's not mingled with other stuff. It's just God said it and I'm going to follow him. And if I've understood it correctly from the word, I'm going to put my mind to it, and I'm going to put my faith to it, and I'm going to trust him and follow him. That's a sincere faith. And so it gives us, from what Paul's teaching here, this, this, uh, I don't like the word formula, but this, this idea of an outcome for my life to be an expression and a vehicle of the love of God. So I get that, and that's powerful. How do, I, how do I kind of keep myself going in that direction? Well, periodically, maybe every day, but often, just test your heart. Where are the motivations? Is it pure? Just follow the Lord. I want to follow the Lord. How about your conscience? Is it clear, a conscience that's void of offenses towards God? God and, and man, and, and remember, that doesn't mean you never do anything wrong. It doesn't mean that at all. If that was true, then we don't need the cross. It means that we're running to the cross on a regular basis saying, thank you, Jesus, for dying for this sin and paying the price. And a sincere faith that no matter what circumstances seem to be piled in front of me, all the reasons in the world not to trust the Lord, As for me, I'm going to trust the Lord. And by faith, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other and say, Jesus, carry me through. And I have just found that this is such a powerful, powerful uh, section helping us to come back for what's the outcome, looking at the outcome. How do I get that outcome to be that expression of God's love? Well, by periodically testing my heart, testing my conscience, and testing that sincerity of faith. You know, I love Paul. I'm so looking forward to 2 Timothy. I've never preached through 2 Timothy, but this is the end of his life. This will be the crown uh, jewel, so to speak, when the, the guillotine or the executioner's axe, they're, they're sharpening it. You can almost hear it in the background of 2 Timothy. And Paul gets to this end and he says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And yet we see in this very letter three groups of people that were very, very close to Paul. 
that had abandoned him and deserted him in his moment of need. First of all, in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, all those who are in Asia. Now, I don't know. We're inerrancy people. (laughs) So it says what it means, and it means what it says. Somehow there was a time when everybody in this area abandoned Paul. Then he goes on in chapter 4 and says, And Demas, who is listed other places as being one of his right-hand men, Demas abandoned me too. He loved the world too much. He's off, I think, in Thessalonica. And then finally, when he had gone to court and had these charges brought against him, he said, nobody came to my defense or to stand by me, but all deserted me. Now, if you're past the age of five, (laughs) you've had people abandon you in your life and and desert you. It's just, it's part of living in a fallen world, right? And I don't know many people, I'd like, I'd rather have you come up and punch me in the nose than like abandon me. (laughs) It's like the worst. And yet Paul, whose goal, his outcome goal was to walk with Christ so that that outcome would be love. And Paul says, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. And he delivered me. And Paul makes this crazy statement, may it not be charged against them. And deep in our hearts we're saying, but doesn't somebody need to pay pay for that? Abandoning Paul. Paul could say that because he knew it had already been paid for. Already in Christ's Christ's control. Already done. And it freed him then to love these people until the very end. So a checklist in a way of how we can keep our Lives exhibiting that outcome of God's love for other people we have in 1 Timothy 1, 5. I don't know if we could bow our heads for a moment. And if the Lord has uh, spoken to your heart, maybe you could take uh, um, just this time now to just listen to him and check your heart. Maybe you could do these three things right now. Just check your heart and and to check your conscience and just to check your faith, just you and Jesus, to follow him with all of your heart. Father, thank you for these immensely practical words and yet this profound understanding of your love shown in the gospel. And oh boy, Lord, do we need this in our world today and maybe it's just been all through time. We need this. We need this outcome from you to show us what it will look like when we're aligned and in harmony and walking with you and obedient to you and sensitive to you and responsive to you. And so in these next minutes, we come to you. Let our hearts be changed and renewed, flowing from the grace that we found in you. And Lord, we've come to know the weakness that we see in ourselves will be stripped away by that power of your love. And so, Father, take this song as a sweet offering to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand together as we close. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I found 
in you. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away. close in prayer. Father, we sense that you've spoken to us this morning from the nine o'clock hour till this hour and now through this hour. And Father, help us to have just hearts that are just pure, unencumbered with other motivations. Father, just to follow you, just to walk with you in that sweetness of your presence with your empowering and a a conscience, Father, where we've made use and run to the cross when we've needed to, Father, for our own failures, but also for the failures of maybe brothers or sisters or spouses or whatever. Lord, that we've gone to the cross and the cross has grown and grown and is bigger and bigger in our life because of its power. And just a a faith that's just sincere like a little child that just looks up at mom or dad and there's just no hint or no doubt of that mom and dad can be trusted and counted on and what they say they'll do father give us that kind of just childlike 
faith. Sometimes, Lord, we, we feel like we've, we've gotten so sophisticated and we can think everything through 10 different ways. Help us to put our will and even our mind on under submission to your spirit, Father. Just pure and simple devotion to Jesus. And Father, we sense that when Jesus said when salt loses its savor, it's worth nothing, throw it out on the path. Let people walk on it. But maybe, Lord, what makes the church have savor like salt is this manifestation of the love of God through Christ and the gospel to people that don't know Jesus. So put on our minds, Lord, would you today, the people in our circles, Lord, that don't know Christ, help us to be salty with them, Father, with the savor, the preciousness of the gospel and the light of the gospel. And Lord, next time, at the end of the day, we look back at our life, help us to see this beautiful, powerful love that's been expressed through us. Thank you for our ability to gather today for each and every person that's here, young and old. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray.